Okay, everybody, welcome to uh, the December Novak Eclipse SIG meeting. Um, this is our um, 11th meeting, I think. And uh, the main, main topic this time is going to be uh, wrapping up people's observations from the October annular eclipse, uh, mainly people we didn't get to last time we got together. So we'll start in with that. I'll share my screen and see if we can get going. So, okay, bring me on and move ahead. This is what we've got for the agenda tonight. Um, as I said, it turns out we have a lot of members reports, a lot of good pictures from the annual eclipse. So I'm gonna keep the announcements short and I'll get right into that. Uh, I got a uh, notice from, uh, actually from Circle Shed. I don't know if any of you follow it, but um, it's a uh, it's an outfit that has optic surplus. And one of the things they've pointed out, uh, there is a, a guide from uh, a, a retired instructor at the University of Charleston on how to build a simple projection sun telescope. Uh, you can see it in those cardboard boxes at the bottom. He's refined it over several years. Uh, now they're built in standard U-line cardboard boxes. I think they're 16 inches long. And basically it's a, um, you can either cons uh, consider it a telephoto lens or a telescope with a um, a Barlow. But basically there's a about a 500 millimeter objective and a, uh, a weak negative secondary lens that gives you a much larger solar image than you would get with anything else you could do in such a short box. And he's refined the design so it can be done entirely out of cardboard, uh, as is shown there. And uh, a surplus shed, which is now fit in Pennsylvania, they sell a pair of lenses which you can use to make this for $5 for the pair. And they're not acromats, they're not fancy, but um, there's something that you can do with children or you can do yourself, put it together and have an easily displayable uh, solar view. If you use uh, the, the better uh, matched lenses, you get a, about a four inch diameter solar image in a 16 inch long box, I think it is. And, um, when I post the videos, you'll see the URLs there. Or if you're interested, you can just Google um, Terry Richardson safe, or Safe Solar Viewer, and he's got an article that describes how to build it. He also suggests if you have uh, a leftover so-called hobby killer refractor, uh, a cheap 50 millimeter um, Japanese, Chinese refractor that nobody wants to use anymore, you could use that for the objective and just buy a buy a negative a negative lens to go with it. Second thing I want to remind people about the uh, uh, the the um, Kalamazoo Astronomical Society series. They've had two talks already. Uh, Tyler Nigren talked about eclipse art, and um, Alan Dyer had his first presentation. He's got a second presentation coming up on December fifteenth. And there was also a notice, if you go to their website, um, they posted the two previous sessions. So you could catch up if you want. But they've got really the people to hear about eclipse photography and eclipse uh, observation planning. It's a great outlet. It's a great series. And it's free. Uh, the third thing I wanted to mention uh, yesterday or the day before, I went to a, a, a listened in to an ASP session on uh, basically citizen science for the eclipse. And uh, if you're interested in any of those projects, that includes um, uh, Debbie, that I know that Dan Ward's participating in, and Citizen Kate, which are projects to record live the entire eclipse. There's also Eclipse Mega Movie, which is a repetition of something which was tried uh, in uh, 2017 to get a very high resolution animation of the entire duration of the eclipse. And by getting an animation of the entire eclipse 
uh, from coast to coast, you'd be able to notice changes in the corona and the chromosphere uh, during the course of uh, the four or five hours that it takes to get across the continent. There are some others which are non-observational, like eclipse soundscapes, and um, there are some radio experiments if people are interested in some kind of radio astronomy. Um, uh, Sonic Jove, Ham SCI, and the GLOBE project, which I believe will be recording the darkness at various sites. So these are several types of uh, citizen science you can get into, especially if you're not tied up uh, taking photographs during, uh, before, during, and after the eclipse. Okay, so now we're going to get into the members' reports. Uh, I haven't put them here. They're not here quite in order. I think we're going to start with uh, Kevin. And um, Kevin, I think he's online. Yes. Yep, there he is. And um, why don't you unmute and you uh, give the narr narration of what you'd like to say about uh, where you went and what you did and what lessons you learned for uh, for April in particular. Yeah, and you know, maybe it's great to start with me because I'm probably at the lowest level of everybody here. Um, you know, I, I said that before when you, you know, the earlier meetings that I was not going to take any equipment. I really don't have any equipment. I basically have binoculars. Um, so, um, I mean, my goal was just to actually be there um, where, uh, where an annual eclipse occurred. I've never been in one before. I've been in a total eclipse but I've not been, of course, partial eclipses, but I've never been in an annular before, or at least you can't ever remember being in one before. Um, so, you know, heeding the advice, though, that was discussed at some of the meetings um, uh, and just some general kind of information, I, I knew that I probably wanted to go to the Southwest just because, um, you know, it's drier and therefore it seems like the cloud covers might be less. So we chose San Antonio. And basically that had two reasons because the first reason was that was where the annual eclipse was going to occur. Um, but that's also where, or in that area, the total eclipse will occur in April and, and we're hoping to go to that too. So we kind of were, for lack of better words, kind of using the trip as a reconnaissance trip, you know, so we could, you know, kind of find it the area and, and, um, you know, just kind of see what all was available. And, and, and this is kind of important what I'm going to say here. It was also mentioned in some of those meetings that, you know, it's a good idea to, to check some places out and decide the place that you're going to go. Um, might have other attractions, too. Uh, obviously, if there's cloud cover, you're not going to be able to see an eclipse. So, um, and by the way, I think that did happen. Somebody here, I think, went to Chris, Corpus Christi or something. I, I think that was fought or, or clouded, clouded in or someplace, but... Um, at any rate, uh, we were in San Antonio. We didn't have that problem. Um, but we did get there on Friday. The eclipse was Saturday. So we looked around. We knew some things that we may want to do. One was river walk, so we did that. Um, there's actually also a, a safari that you can take in uh, San Antonio, of all places. Uh, so we did that. And, and those were Friday, but, well, actually, the safari is Friday. Saturday, we did the eclipse. Um, and then that's the area that you're, what you're showing now, um, Alan. There was, uh, I was hoping to attach with a group that kind of might have some instruments, might have some background, which they did. So I would just hung out with them. And then there were some, you know, so you could see basically some of the equipment that the, that the, uh, the other uh, people there had. And what was particularly interesting to me too um, was a couple of the of the amateur astronomers, that what they did is they um, they used the pinhole uh, camera, and I think I pinhole uh, rather a projection screen, and I think I sent a picture of that, which you can see the crescent of the um, uh, you know oh this one here is the crescent uh, of the of the um, of the sun through the trees. And uh, so that was obviously a very interesting thing to uh, actually get a chance to observe that too at the same time. Um, and then, um, then there was the pinhole projection. Um, and then there were some other kind of discussions that were going on uh, over the course of, I guess, an hour and a half or so for the eclipse. So, um, so it was kind of enjoyable. 
Um, I'm glad we did it. Um, obviously, it was the first time. Glad the weather cooperated. It was a little cloudy at first, um, but nothing that was going to be that much of a problem. I, I can't remember whether that that ring of fire picture there was from one of the the astronomers because they were sending some stuff around at the same time, emailing it to people and texting it to people. So I, I think it was from one of them, but you know, I, I can't remember exactly where, where it came from. It could have, for all I know, somebody could have extracted it off some other site on a web or whatever and just sent it. But I think it was from one of the astronomers that was there with one of their, their, their uh, cameras and their uh, scopes. So, but you know, yeah. So basically, like I started off by saying, um, it may be good to start with me because literally I don't have any of the technical detail that, you know, some of your other some of the other presenters here will have. But at least it gives you an idea of what even at a base level, um, you know, what you can do and what you can see at these. And, um, you know, one thing I'm sort of thinking about for the eclipse for um, April is OK. So I mentioned earlier that I've been to a soul to a to a total eclipse. That wasn't 2017. I wanted to, but I got sick, so I couldn't go to the 2017. This was back in a long decades ago. What was very interesting, and I always remember from that, this one of these phenomena is shadow bands. Um, and, you know, to see these waves, these light waves sort of, you know, streaming across the ground just as, you know, totality is occurring is, uh, is really an interesting feature and a phenomena. So, um, I'm looking forward to that and looking glad I went to the annular, glad I was able to see the ring of fire, glad I was able to do some other things in the event, in the case that there would, would have been a problem, which there fortunately cloud cover problem, which there wasn't. Um, and, uh, you know, that's be my recommendations for uh, anybody else as they uh, go to the April eclipse. That's about it. Unless you have some questions. Kevin, it looks like, it looks like your location was dead center on the path of uh, annularity for the moon to have been so well centered on the sun. We're going to uh -huh. see some others later on, someone who's closer to the edge. Well, it was in the San Antonio area. I can't, I think no. San Antonio itself was pretty close to the center. I thought, I think it was a little bit further West up near, maybe it was a Cur Curville or something, but, um, but at any rate, I thought San Antonio was pretty close um but whatever yeah thanks kevin okay yep. let's go let's go on to to joel i think is next gonna... yeah joel miller if you'll unmute right. yeah, we got your yeah. slides okay um yeah so um i ended up in um uh Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, my wife and I had talked about making this trip um, for about a year, but never actually did anything. And at the last minute we decided to go. Um, it turned out to coincide with Albuquerque's uh, International Hot Air Balloon Festival, which is a really big deal there. Uh, so finding rooms wasn't the easiest thing, but uh, we did manage to do that. And uh, we connected with uh, the local astronomy club and ended up for the eclipse at uh, one of their observing sites, which uh, was in Placitas. It's uh, maybe 15, 20 miles northeast of uh, downtown Albuquerque um, and at their library. So uh, in the picture on the right, you can see uh, the camera I set up. Um, I, I Since we flew in and flew out, I didn't take very much. I, I took a, a camera and a tripod and um, a half solar filter, which um, seemed to work out very nicely. And this was uh, uh, just the Bader Astro material uh, glued to a, a ring that fit across, uh, fit around a, a filter on the uh, front of the uh, camera. So um, uh, the details are there on the settings, if that's of interest to anybody. Uh, and then the next slide, um, so um, we got there early. Um, 
found a convenient post to hide the sun behind to get sort of a base image. Uh, the idea was to uh, make a single picture of the uh, uh, full uh, eclipse. And then um, I ended up taking uh, photos of the sun uh, once a minute uh, for the entire eclipse. Uh, and this was so that I could uh, choose whether to do two minute intervals, three minute intervals uh, in the final image. Um, what you see below uh, on the right is um, just the solar images um, every uh, two minutes. So it's 88, photo, uh, 88 images, I believe. Um, you can see above that um, um, one of the one of one of a single image and uh, and sort of a blow up around the sun, um, sort of getting close to the digital resolution of the camera. So there's not a lot of deep, not much detail on the sun itself. Um, but the half filter actually worked out quite well. Um, I, I was a little concerned um, about reflections from the back of the filter. Um, and in a few of the images, there was a little bit of that going on, but it was uh, something easy to clean up. Uh, anyway, if you uh, go to the last slide, uh, when you put everything together, um, I can get this. We were pretty close to the center line as well. If, if you were, if you wanted to blow up the very center of that, uh, you could see that it's uh, that the moon was pretty well centered on the. Uh, Sun, but um, so lessons learned. Um, everything came off without a hitch for me, um, but not so for my wife. And uh, so uh, one of the uh, lessons learned was uh, uh, really make sure you know how your camera is going to react in uh, all conditions. She happened to check on something partway through, and it actually uh, canceled uh, her. Uh, intervalometer, which without her knowing it. And so um, we had checked out the site the day before to make sure that everything that uh, we were going to be facing in a good direction and have a good angle for things. Um, so yeah, everything worked well, um, good weather. Well, we were in a place where we could head, you know, a hundred miles or 150 miles north or south if necessary to uh, dodge clouds, but uh, that turned out not to be necessary, so. Joel, was that half filter, was that opaque on the top or? Yeah, so it's it's it's, uh, the, it's the Bader Solar Astro film. Basically, I, I, I printed a ring that uh, would uh, fit on top of a, a filter and I just glued a semicircle of the film to the top half. Um, okay, homemade, yeah. So, uh, it, you could have done that with a full filter. Uh, one of the recommendations I had read was to use the half filter in that way. If the milling crowd bumps your camera, you still have the bottom half to align things when you, uh, in post-processing. Uh, but it turned out that uh, that wasn't an issue. Interesting. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Joel. Um, next, we've got uh, Lloyd. And he's... Uh, yeah, hi. He spoke to okay. us before, but I think uh, this is a successful uh, report of what he actually saw. So let me start yeah. with that. Yeah, yeah I'll... Uh... And, and Lloyd, did, you look you I, looked at how I modified your slides, right? I, I know, yeah, yeah, good, very good. Okay, so we're all in here someplace. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so uh, so we ended up going. So of course, this is the NASA chart showing the the annual eclipse coming from you know Oregon down to Texas, and the uh, to, to, totality next April coming up from you know through Texas up to Maine, and. You know, there's an area when people know 120 square miles, uh, 120 miles square in the center where both uh, eclipses are visible. So go to the next chart. And so, you know, we were in uh, the town of Kerrville. Now, now the reason we picked Kerrville is it really was based on next April. You know, uh, I'm working with a friend that 
uh, is out at uh, Griffith Observatory in LA. And we arranged with the, the uh, university there, Schreiner University, to use uh, you know part of half of their soccer field to have a large group come. And uh, and so that's really the you know the plan for April. So of course in October, you know we actually had two objectives. We just had a small group, me, him. You know it was le less than a dozen people. Uh, but primarily was to coordinate, you know, with the university and and the hotel we're staying at, uh, you know, in preparation for next April, uh, check out the city. But also because we're right there, and you know, in the annularity, it's also a chance to see the annular eclipse and the total eclipse within six months of each other, and uh, which is kind of cool. And you can see that we, uh, we you know, we're really well positioned for the. Uh, Total eclipse is only a few miles off the center line, you know, uh, ex expected duration of totality of uh, four minutes, 20, 23, 24 seconds. Uh, and while we're not centered on, you know, for annularity, we still had four minutes there. So, uh, so you know, that, that was our plan. Now, if it wasn't for next April, if this was just a standalone annular, I might have gone out west to a national park or some other place. But, but of course, for those, those reasons I just mentioned, you know, we went uh, here to Kerrville and, you know, they flew in. Well, actually, in this case, we actually flew into Austin, which was a couple hours away, just, you know, northwest, uh, northeast of San Antonio, spent some time there, then, then went to Kerrville. In April, we're going to be flying into San Antonio, but, uh, uh, but that was the plan. Okay, uh, next. All right, so on the left, you, you see that's the, this is actually a, the field where we had set up. Uh, you know, for the uh, you know, for the annual eclipse, you know, it's wide open space. You know, it, it turned out, you know, I was following the weather forecast, you know, uh, you know, throughout the week and and uh, did see, you know, curl this area is looking pretty good. I mean, there there was, you know, a little bit so, so, so further south in Texas, it seemed there were there were some clouds, but uh, but this while in the mo early morning, it was a little overcast, it did dissipate and pretty well uh the kind of equipment i had you know uh my main lens on the camera was a 600 millimeter uh it was actually 150 to 600 set at 600 and and one thing i did for the first time you know i've been to you know 11 total solar eclipses and a couple annulars before this but this is the first time i tried using a tracking mount so <laughs> it was you know and it, it's this ioptron sky guider pro and uh and, and it it worked pretty well i mean it it you know i mean and, and actually uh you know one of the challenges of course but i got i got practiced a lot before i left was just aligning it during the day you know using a compass and and uh, and that seemed to work out pretty well but it is it is kind of sensitive i mean if you bump into it you have to re realign it and uh and then i also had you see a large Pair of binoculars uh, on another tripod, which which had you know again, of course, solar filters on all. But I also had a handheld uh, uh, image stabilized set of you know binoculars with with filters. So uh, so that's the kind of setup I had. You can just kind of see in the background. My friend Matt is on the left. He has a small telescope, and another friend on the right had a uh, uh, actually a, a, a hydrogen alpha scope. You know, and, all right. Can uh, move ahead, Lloyd. Lloyd, what? Yeah, what'd yeah go do, ahead. What'd you do for power supply, or did you just rely on the internal batteries in the ioptron? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, I, no, I just, I just relied on the battery because, you know, I, I, charging it up fully, you can get, I, I think, you know, like five or five hours. I mean, so yeah, it, it, I didn't have a problem, you know, you know, with, you know, I, you know, with that. So I just made sure it was. The night before fully charged uh and uh and it worked out worked out great you know i do have you know so, you know at home i have a, a power a large battery that you could use with a you know with a telescope but a larger a larger amount you know but but for that i'm gonna need it okay so here's uh one of the shots you know i took uh i was using one of these thermal or thousand oak filters you know, screw on filters, you know, and it, it gives, you know, a nice, you know, yellow orange uh, tone. Well, we know the 
it's really white light but i mean i, I like the look of the color and here you can see you know 25 minutes before there's a sunspot group and and uh, approaching it okay and then here's another shot 11 minutes before before annularity okay and then and then you know throughout the annularity you know i took a lot of you know shots and and uh so this was what i gathered you know zooming in you know to try to identify when a second contact so it's just barely and actually one thing i still want to do and i should have done it by now but put together a a, a little a video of having of having it where you could actually see the uh you know the 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 map you know the beads basically forming as it starts to close and with the the gaps you know representing the mountains on the moon but but this is was second contact and then the next uh one would show you on the click all right so this is mid annularity and and again because we were you know not on the center line you can see it's a little offset but still it was very very beautiful to look at and then finally, you know, third contact. So, you know, this is the the span of, you know, just a little less than four minutes, you know, taking into account, you know, the, the you know, where the the ring, you know, fully forms and where it breaks up. But uh but that, you know, worked out pretty pretty well. And then um were, were you using then, an intervalometer or software? Well, I, you had no computer there. Yeah, I don't know. Longer. Yeah, no, not not for this one. For this one, I just was, you know, trying to, you know, snap away. Now, now I now I do need to get something, you know, because because also for this because it was just basically I just had the same settings too. I didn't change those. I think it was, uh, uh, you know, one, you know, one hundredth of a second. You know, uh, you know, the ISO one hundred, I think, and then f 6.3 and whatever the mac you know for the so you know it it worked out i mean i tried a few different ones you know initially just to get a good view of the sun and, and it was just constant now i do need to now lesson learn of course if i'm going to use this uh uh same tracking mount for you know when we go to totality you know I'm, i obviously you want to change the exposure you know to, to get the whole range you know when when you take off the filter so I'm going to need to uh, uh, figure out the best way to do that you know, using a computer or a thermometer or maybe some software to control the camera. Because, you know, when I used to do this in the past, just having it on a fixed tripod and moving it slightly, you know, you can get in there and uh, and just change it manually. But if you start doing that, it'll just, with, with a, this kind of tracking, man, it'll just get misaligned very quickly. So... I might be looking for, <laughs> for uh, suggestions, but I mean, I'll, I'm going to try. You know, obviously, do a lot of testing beforehand, before next April. Okay, and then here's one that's yeah, you know, on the far side. I mean, I did follow it all the way from you know first contact all the way to fourth contact, and and you know got a you know little sliver there of the of the moon, but uh, but yeah, it, it actually was was very very successful and uh uh again it was kind of you know again the primary reason for going was to coordinate with everyone in advance of next april but you know just because it's the annual eclipse and it, it was great to be there and uh and have that work out and uh and when i actually forwarded uh you know some of these photos to the person at the university you know i worked with they were really yeah glad to get that and i think they're gonna put some of these in some of their material you know they did have a a little group you know in another area uh and, and they had some a little talk beforehand including for someone from nasa there's another part of Kerrville where there's a big park where they actually had a little festival going on uh which included a few people i think from nasa and from other folks uh of course we we were here for the for the eclipse we did stop by there later in the weekend and i think i may have one more night before i took a piece of cardboard and i punched holes in it you know to try to make a, you know commemorate the annual eclipse and and uh Kerrville. and so that worked out pretty well as you can see with the with the crescent suns you know having it just overlay on a, another white piece of uh, <clears throat> uh paper 
and uh, and again, yeah, we're going to be coming going back there in in April, and uh, you know, trying to university. So yeah, it was a very very successful trip. It turned out, and uh, and plus, you know, just checking out the area too. You know, it's the hill country of Texas. It is it is one of the best locations in the in the U.S. You know, in terms of the weather prospects for next April, and uh, and there's a lot of interesting things to do around there, but but mainly. <laughs> You know, looking forward to you know get lots still a lot to get ready, you know, for the event. Any any questions? Any other questions? All right, thanks. On on your white sheets, did you see any uh, any shadow bands? Any indication of it? Uh, no, work? no, we yeah we didn't. I mean, I don't need. Um, yeah, no. I mean, it, I don't know how close we were looking. I think we did try to look a little bit, but I mean, a lot was going on. I mean, for totality, I mean, definitely, you know, we know it's about two, three minutes before and, and after. Uh, but uh, but for this, this, it, it, you know, it didn't get, you know, we did notice, you know, it, 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 the sky color did get a little, little deeper, you know, blue and and i mean it really didn't change too much you know in terms of the overall light i mean it still was you know way too bright to look at it you know without a filter but um yeah, but I was yeah. Just since you had the white paper down there and since it's less hectic than yeah, no, that's good. Clips, yeah. So it's a chance cool. to look for them yeah i mean also yeah. you know <laughs> spent a lot of time you know getting ready i mean went to the, the local store got like a you know colander and a cheese grater but we just but this thing worked out the best you know just a little punching a little cardboard and we'll be doing something similar you know for 2024 you'll be able to reuse the same one just change the last digit yeah well i'll let you punch the holes well yeah <laughs> maybe i'll line it up a little better but <laughs> uh, lloyd would you would you suggest that uh that the Schrader University would be a, a a target location for for others for the for the April eighth event. Well, if anybody, you know, the only you know the thing is, you know, right now we we coordinate with them to use part of the field and and have kind of like a a maximum number, which we could probably accommodate a few more. So if anyone is interested, they could contact me, and and I could probably get folks on the list. You know, it's not it's not open generally. It's not going to be just open to the public for anyone to just come on on the campus. You know that you have to be pre coordinated. They're going to have a list of names at the gate. And uh, now the big challenge, of course, is finding you know lodging. You know, I did coordinate. Uh, you know, about a you know, back in March with one hotel, the Wild Ranch Hotel there, which uh, is actually a really nice place. They what they do, I mean, they have like a a four night package deal which goes from uh, Friday uh, the 5th through Tuesday the, the 9th, uh, which includes three buffet meals per day. Now it is about, you know, a little over, you know, $2,000, you know, 2100 dollars $2, for the four nights, including, including all the clean meals. But, you know, I, you know, it's actually, I think, you know, yeah, and they still actually have rooms too. So, as far as other hotels, you know, in the area, you know, a lot of them, some of them are sold out. Some of them, I think, few of them may not even have a, even open up their reservations yet because they're just waiting to demand a skyrocket and they're going to just really soak people for, every, yeah. you know. Now, there are people, I, I have like a, a group of maybe about, you know, friends and family members, you know, about 40, you know, and there are a few that are staying in San Antonio and that's about an hour drive without traffic. But, you know, they're they're going to have to, leave i think pre-dawn maybe i mean it, it's hard to you know traffic is really going to be bad but i mean that's an option too but uh uh but yeah i mean that's certainly a, a, a you know a great spot you know curville in terms you know along the path and again getting lodging is is the is the is the key thing you know of actually having it in there in the city makes it really easy because the hotel is only a few miles away and yeah. Lloyd, Lloyd, would you put the name of the hotel either in the chat or send me an email so I can yes. I can list it? 
okay uh, as a possibility as long as you know they still have places because that's i yeah, imagine last time i looked uh yeah yeah it's, it's called the y-o ranch hotel but yeah I'll, i could send you an, an email okay thanks yeah thanks thanks Lloyd. okay so let's go on to um joyce uh, hey alan before you leave this yeah. um let me just mention that i was am planning to stay in uh, San Antonio for a portion of the period on either side of the eclipse in April. And uh, the person I'm staying with is getting up in age and she hasn't returned my emails huh, lately. So I went ahead and made reservations at some Hampton Inns in the area and I didn't have any problem doing that. And I just wanted to pass that along in San Antonio. Hampton Inn Hampton in San Antonio. Okay. Yeah, there's a few of them, so that's not very specific, but I didn't have any problem making those reservations. I made them about two weeks ago. Yeah. Did you um, make it directly with the hotel or with their website? So, I mean, if, uh, I, made, you know, I made it on the Hilton website. On the Hilton, yeah. So, I mean, if people look for the, the Hampton Inns in San Antonio, they could look at all of them on the Hilton sure. site. Absolutely. Yeah. It and was, I used. I use points, but the prices weren't yeah. unreasonable. I think they were in the neighborhood of between 100 and 150 bucks. Yeah, that's not bad. And, and it is the interstate, so as long as you get going early, you should be able to get up to the central line in places like Kerrville. Very good. Thanks for the ideas. Okay, so let's go on to Joyce. And she has a different kind of view of the eclipse. She did some artistic work. So if you'll unmute Joyce and take over. Okay. Um, I did not have in my solar eclipse or my eclipse collection an annular and had never seen one. So I had the rest um, and go to the next slide. Um, I would, I went, figured I could go out to Colorado, see fall colors, and then go into Utah. So I was originally going to meet friends, um, it was about three hours south of Salt Lake in central Utah, but the whole week, the clouds were just kind of predicted to be a light cover. And by Thursday, it was definitely going to be a light cover of clouds there so the only area that had been clear all week was the four corners area colorado utah so from where i was it was easier for me to go south so i did um, look for a location try to be away from light pollution try to be away from the maddening crowds and ended up near bluff utah and my photo pills said uh, I was in Bears Ears National Monument. Since I was camping, I my my goal in the 2017 eclipse and in this one and in next springs is to go where the weather is clear. And that means last minute adaptations. <laughs> um, so that was what I did here, and being able to camp made it an easy thing to do Did, on, on that um that display on the right what's the software that that's gives photo you that's photo pills photo pills on the phone photo pills photo pills okay and you can you can look at the location of the milky way you can look at the location of the there, there's a nighttime augmented reality where you can see where the stars and the moon are. Um, the daytime, you could see the approximate path of the sun. It's a really cool app, yeah. and uh, I use it all the time. And I think I think it's available. I think a desktop version is supposed to be coming out, um, and I think it's available on Androids. Don't hold me to that, um, but I think it is. But you want it to be portable. Desktop yeah, I mean, I, I use it on my phone because yeah. when I 
Right. And you can do future planning as well. You can find a landscape feature and get into the software more deeply than I am capable, but you can plan the angles of your shoots. You can plan the angles of, of things out, you know, way up ahead of time. Right. And the, this, that picture with the truck is, was my setup for the day. I was aiming for weather, which actually ended up just being perfect. The, uh, there was just these light clouds in the afternoon that is what I used for my composite picture. Um, I had a little bit of a pretty sunset. I had a clear shot for the Milky Way. And where my friends were in Utah, where it actually turned out to have light clouds, they're they're annular. They could see it, but all the pictures had a little bit of fuzz to it because the clouds were obscuring it. But where they set up to go take a Milky Way picture, which is normally totally dark sky, the entire horizon in the direction of the Milky Way was filled with campers and people with lights. So they um, they did not have a great uh, Milky Way shot because of the amount of camping. I could only from where I went to lights from, from some campers in the distance. And it was absolutely clear the next morning for the eclipse. So that was what I aimed for. I was very close to the center line um, and it was nice and peaceful. So the equipment that I used, I had um, Nikon Z7 II that was astro converted. So le lessons learned here, I forgot that I have to use a filter for daylight shooting on the astro. And since it's the 14 to 24, which is a really big wide lens, it's a big, huge filter. Well, my solar filter from 2017, of course, didn't fit. Gaffer's tape to the rescue that is taped on to the surface of the filter. And it worked fine. I, I didn't have to, it, it didn't restrict the field of view or anything like that. But um, it's a good idea to have some gaffer's tape in your vehicle. Um, and then I had Nikon Z8 with a 100 to 400, obviously set at 400. And that was just one of the Daystar film filters. And what I had done for the 2017 um, was I had cut out a hard foam, just a, a hard foam circle and put the Daystar filter on the outside of that. And then I, it just slipped easily over, easily but firmly over the end of the lens, which of course I didn't need for the annular, but for the solar, for the total, it will, I can slide it off really easily for the uh, totality. I'm a, this is Greg. Uh, this sounds very interesting. And uh, I did the same thing uh, using the uh, universal uh, Daystar filter this last time, recognizing I probably need to do something different for the total eclipse. But I didn't quite follow what you were saying about the uh, styrofoam piece or whatever that you cut. Uh, uh, I should have taken a lens. picture of it. Um, so, so it's like a ring that fits on the outside of the, uh, of the, of the lens? Yeah, so okay. you so I have I have the lens sitting there with its I took its um hood off, so I just have the lens. Right. And then I just cut a circle of um of a stiff foam. You could do a styrofoam. This was a sort of a styrofoamy thing. And then I put the Daystar has the it's just a cardboard thing and it has tabs that go on the side. Right. I don't know. You can go back to the picture that has the truck in it. Um, 
might be able to zoom in on that on the see if, can see if you can zoom in well i i can certainly see it and i'm familiar with the day star so okay so instead of being the day star kind of taped or sorted directly onto the lens the day right. star is is taped or glued onto this just round piece of foam that fit that slipped really snugly but not hard over the end of the lens okay and so the day star is totally separate doesn't have any connection to the lens except that it's held on by the just the tension of this firm piece of foam and all i had to do was just slide it off so it slid off really really easily for totality so the foam ring and the daystar filter come off at the same time yeah they come off at the same time so the foam ring is okay. firmly attached i don't remember if i taped it or glued it to make sure that that whole thing stayed Good. as one unit greg i've i've done two okay. things i've tried two things that work one it's sort of a modification of what joy said but what i used was uh, foam core the um two mm -hmm. layers of cardboard with styrofoam in between which is a little bit easier to cut and and do multiple layers and attach them together yeah. to make it thicker um because i'm afraid of loose pieces of styrofoam with static electricity sticking uh -huh. to the lens because that you know yeah, that's the best, that's a nasty problem. Yeah, that's that's why I use instead of real styrofoam. This was like sometimes you'll get something packed in something that has firm kind of plasticky. It's not styrofoam, it's more like plastic and it's about half an inch thick and it's black. Okay. I've gotten it mm -hmm. in various stages of things that have come or boxes that are cradling something and I just save it and it turned out to be the perfect stuff because you didn't have that exact problem with the styrofoam. The, the yeah, other thing I've, I've tried been... cutting out styrofoam and all I had was bits. Yeah. The, the other thing is I've used uh, black sort of rubbery foam mm -hmm. like, like the lining from uh, an optics box uh, and cut it mm -hmm. just a little bit smaller than the front of I, I just did it on binoculars and that way you get a friction fit I'm a little bit concerned that if there's a breeze and you have something that's sort of loose the wind can pull it off even yeah, though this, you, even though yeah. you're going to be looking up yeah this um this plastic this foam stuff I can try and take a picture and put it in the groups that I owning is it has enough tension on it that and enough sort of plasticky stickiness without being too sticky so i won't i don't actually it's easy to it's easy to slide off without any vibration or or moving the camera but it definitely has purchase okay you know it, it holds on it well these are great ideas thank you both so then, of course, I had to shoot through my iPhone because I found out about the so, so, Solar Snap app. And so I got their little piece to stick on the front of my iPhone and had fun. Um, the first one you, over on the left, you can see I hadn't figured out quite how to get the focusing right. And I got a few that were pretty decent. Um, the pictures weren't great, but... It took a little bit of practice to hold the phone up. I thought I was going to put it on a little tripod, but you really couldn't do that very easily. Um, and it took a little practice to get the the um, to find the the sun in your camera. But it was a fun thing to do, and it certainly would be a lot of fun for um, for people 
who are not trying to play with big cameras. And I didn't get a totality because I was too busy with my other um, shooting. Next. The, um, the camera settings, I had three bits for everything up to total. That way I didn't have to think about it. And the Z8, I had it two stops for each bracket. The Z7, one stop. And for the total, I went up to five stop, five stops. I mean, five brackets, sorry, not five stops. Um, and I just did it manually. I there's plenty. It was plenty of time. I'm comfortable enough with the camera that I just triggered it myself every five minutes or so, and then during totality, I just worked the two cameras constantly. Um, I had to obviously move the the Z8 with the 100 to 400. The um, the wide angle got the entire totality in the frame. I didn't have to move the camera at all during that time. So that was where I was at. That was the total. That was the the total shoot, and I put this on the shot I took the day before because the clouds that were in there when I got there were much prettier than the totally blue sky that I had on the day of the shoot. So it's a little bit fake, but that's okay. There's a lot more fake coming. Next. <laughs> so... The reason for my eclipse obsession is the creation of interesting things. So that was my initial just playing around with just the annular part of the eclipse. This, this image started in 2017 with just a simple infinity or figure eight that you can see if you follow the infinity around or the figure eight laying on its side. And then, oh, I've forgotten, 2019 was a lunar eclipse here. So I added that in. And then I, of course, added in the uh, annular when I got home. So this is, this is a long-term creation. Next. And then this is where I kind of went crazy and played with the, all the different phases of all the different eclipses. And this is why I like to shoot eclipses. So this time, now I have all of these things have gone a little bit nuts. Next. This, this was a lot of fun. I think it crashed my computer making it, though. <laughs> um, I had to take it to the Apple store to rebuild it. And this is the first one I made, but it's actually my favorite one with all the phases of the eclipses. The Fibonacci spiral, which started all this other crazy creations. So that's it. That's very interesting, Joyce. Thanks for sharing. It's it is so much fun. I'm if I start on one of these, I can't go to bed at night. I end up <laughs> staying up way too late because it's like, well, I could just do a little more here and a little more there. That's a lot of fun. Do you do any processing or is it <clears throat> is it just compositing the uh well I mean I, I do an initial processing in Lightroom and then put it in Photoshop and it's all composited. So I have any exposures or anything that I might need to do, I've done before I import it into Photoshop and start playing. Okay. Uh, Joyce, your images are, are tremendous. They're, uh, I love them. They're, they're really something. Um, I'm curious, when you, how do you manage shooting in this situation? The thing that I've been thinking about with April coming up next year, and I'm most worried about is having a camera that's that is generally um, 
set to take images uh, in a in a normal solar sky with a solar filter, and then having to rapidly shift to to essentially you know daytime slash nighttime uh, imagery without a without a filter. I'm just wondering if if you had any thoughts about that, or Alan, anybody wanted to say anything about that because that's that's the thing that's kind of bothering me the most about uh, setting up for for next April. Um, but your your images are are, are really really impressive that's great thanks are do you mean having do you have a, a converted camera is that your question no i i have a i have a uh just a typical canon uh eos mm -hmm. um uh, which i you know i put a a, a film uh, mm -hmm. a beta style whatever a solar filter on the front of it and i i can get reasonably decent um images of of the sun my concern is how do you shift from that with the short time of uh, that you have to transition between you know the, the this extremely bright image to to uh to get decent pictures of totality which uh, of real totality which is uh, obviously extremely different without a filter yeah well one thing you want your filter easy to pull off so that you don't have any any seconds lost once it's time to put your filter off. I guess there's now um, there's apps that will tell you exactly when to pull your filter off. Oh, okay. <laughs> I read about that somewhere. That was on here that tells you the exact time for pulling the filter off. But um, oh. it's I think. In shooting the the whole totality on this one, I was just able to put the camera to take five, do a, a five stop difference. Right. When I shot the 2017 total, um, I I was doing some manual adjusting. I still had my um, bracketing. I don't remember what I three or five or whatever, but I had to manually change my shutter speed mm -hmm. in order to have enough um well shutter speed and i probably i don't think i changed my aperture i think i just worked with shutter speed and just manually changed that and, but that's and gonna, you, that's gonna take some practice I, that's what i was going to ask you practice and you knew what you wanted to change it to uh, because one thing that i recall from 2017 that surprised me is that I really couldn't see the camera after the bright imagery of uh, the, the, shooting the the sun. My eyes were not adjusted to look at a darkened camera, and I just I found that it was problematic. And I got to a point where I just said, "To heck with the whole thing! I'm just going to sit back and take it in." And uh, so I I didn't even try to shoot totality after a few minutes, a few moments. But um, you know what? I think I remember. Um throwing a t-shirt over my head <laughs> so that I could see my camera for a little bit. I think yeah. I remember that piece of it. Um, you know, back, back in the old days, that's what we had to do. You, you hid underneath your black cloth. Well, now we're kind of in the same, the same aspect, trying to look at these digital screens. Mm, it's all this new. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, and a focusing hood is, is good. Um, they used to call mm. them focusing hoods, but just so, so you can get the focus very precisely. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps because one of the things with, with most of the cameras, most of the 35s, um, you're going to be looking through the, either the back screen or if it doesn't tilt or the eyepiece generally in the direction of the sun. And you can't avoid but looking at the sun as you do that, unless you put a cloth over the whole assembly. Now, if you've got an articulated um, display screen, that helps quite a bit. It helps a lot. But then, but then you've got the problem that the sun will be shining on the on the screen itself. So, yeah, you've got a problem. There's a lot of contrast. Um, yeah. The other the other things to think about. And it's one of the rules I learned very early on 
learn your camera so well that you know which buttons to press and where yep. to press things, even without necessarily having to look at it. But get the feel of the camera just by taking a lot of pictures. Uh, yeah, and, and actually, I do a lot of night photography. So I would, and at that point, I was doing a huge night photography project and, that involved basically driving up to locations, setting up a camera, doing a shoot, and then moving on to another location. And so I was totally comfortable with my camera, whether I was looking at dials or not. My fingers know where those buttons are. If I need to change shutter speed, I know exactly where my finger is going to go and what direction it's going to go in, what button I need to push. Yeah, um, that's always so a good I, skill. Uh, and see, even in astrophotography, we get we get sloppy and we lose we turn on a bright red light and look mm -hmm. at look at dials and indicators and you and that's not going to work at the solar eclipse. Right. Uh, th the other observation is to put weights on the tripod so you don't knock it as around as easily because um if you're fiddling with either the filter putting it on taking it off or changing exposures manually you're more likely to jar the camera and if you can put 10 or 20 pounds of rocks on the tripod with a what they call them a sling or what i did in 2017 was I got a five gallon, I, I got a, a gallon jug and filled it with water once I got there to hang from the hook on the tripod to hold it in place. Yeah. And of course, if you do all those things, you never bounce it. It's only when you don't do those things <laughs> that you hit it. But Murphy's Law. <laughs> but, um, you know, there are a couple of things to, to make the tripod more rugged, such that if you do put too much force on the camera, you can still recover. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is you can take the filter off well before Bailey's beads, well before like 30 seconds mainly, because that last crescent isn't really all that interesting. And you uh, and you can take your Bailey's beads photograph at the same exposure as the inner corona, as the inner chromosphere. Um, so that would be the same exposure time you use through Bailey's beads till the beginning of totality, the second contact. And then you start with the longer exposures. And then hopefully you're back down to a short exposure just before third contact. And you can and you can leave the camera going. And and my other, you know, my own belief going in. If you don't get the filter on immediately after third contact, you're not going to kill the camera. The the uh, there are you don't want to leave it staring at the sun once the moon moves away, but the first crescent after totality can be overexposed by mistake, and you're not going to burn anything out. It's just that when thirty seconds later, when you remember that you haven't put the filter on put it on gently and then take the rest of your series. And, and that should work. Um, I see. Yeah, the past posters, you could just keep clicking away and you'll get, you know, some interesting <laughs> shots, of, you know, Bailey's beads, but then brighter and brighter and brighter. You'll find out how good, yeah. How much internal reflection you have inside your lens. Yeah, right. Exactly. You get something that. artistic, uh, burn, burn through in the imagery. But, um, yeah, practice, practice, practice. And, um, you know, when you go through the timing sequence, as you practice before the real eclipse, take the filter off, but then put it back on again, if you care, or just not even have the sun there, but just go through the timing sequence um, and, and get some muscle memory of the kinds of things you're going to be doing at totality, even if you can't really be taking pictures. Uh, but go through exactly the maneuvers and the setup. Uh, and even something like the, the software that Joyce showed that shows where the sun will be. You can do it the day before in the afternoon. I'm assuming the eclipse is going to be in the morning. You can do it at four o'clock in the afternoon and point the camera where the sun will be when the eclipse occurs the next day. 
and make sure that you have a clear shot and that uh, things aren't in the way, either close to the camera or in the distance, uh, knowing where the sun will be when the eclipse occurs. And also, when it, it, depending on how long a, a period of time, from the start, from first contact to fourth contact, you want to make sure you minimize any interference from uh, structures at the place you choose. But I'd also say, as, as Joyce was saying um, um, about her sighting, um, you want to be there at least a day in advance to go through the, the motions and, and verify your site. If you have to relocate because of weather, that's something different. But get familiar with the place that's your primary observing site at least 24 hours in advance. I don't know. I, but I keep on forgetting the lessons I learned the last time. <laughs> and especially for yeah. this one coming up in uh, in April, uh, you know, when you practice at home before going out, make sure you know you know about where to point because this it's going to be high like where we're going to be in curve is going to be about 67 68 degrees right elevation so uh uh it was only like 46 or so for for the annular clubs where we were but uh but you know that you know you know everything you know i mean that, that can come into play how high of a you know how high you have to set the tripod get a good look i mean you know it's yeah, those kind of things. It's easy to get surprised, you know. You don't want to be. You don't want to be surprised when you get there where you have to point. When uh, when Joyce mentioned working with the uh, with the iPhone, I tried it with a filter in front of my iPhone <laughs> uh, at approximately the correct altitude for the sun, and realized I couldn't both get the tripod high enough and my head low enough to look at the screen on the iPhone in the direction of the sun and find it. When you put that ND6 filter on the camera, you have no other way, you have no way to find the sun <laughs> until you stumble into it. Um, and, and it helps to have it on a tripod where you can zoom in, you start wide angle, find the sun with the filter and then zoom in to center it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, if you put it on the tripod to keep it positioned, then the screen's at a very awkward angle. And, yeah, you're uh, not really going to be able to see, especially on, on this next one, because it's going to be pointing upwards so far. Right. right. You're just going to have to hold it. But it's, I mean, if you do hold it, and if you really do your focusing thing with your finger and your exposure thing with your finger then I could end up with it pretty sharp, but I had to definitely, it didn't naturally seem to sharpen itself up. I had to really, you know, I had to touch the sun every time with my finger. And as long as I did that, I could get a focus. The, the, the iPhone would focus on it. Um, Do you guys think there's any role for auto exposure in a solar e eclipse? No, 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 because uh, it'll be it'll be correct. You can get it correct with spot measurement early and partial. But as the moon gets to be a small crescent, the auto exposure gets wrong. It, it, it can't it can't uh, do it correctly. And during totality, it's it's totally confused. It, it just doesn't have the sensitivity to make that measurement. And you want to do bracketing, which it won't allow you to do. You want to do more bracketing than will be built in. So you really have to go to manual. I was going to say, I, um, I found an app um, called uh, ProShot for P-R-O-S-H-O-T for the iPhone, which I'd mentioned before. It's made by the same company. I tried comes... to find it and couldn't find it that day. Oh, okay. It's made by the same company, but gives you more control mm -hmm. than, than the um, Solar Snap. And I couldn't make the Solar Snap work on the sun. Um, 
with an ND5 filter in front, uh, with a, a solar filter in front. But what's the, the one? What's it called again? Now? Pro shot. P R O H O T. Okay. Um, on the on the Apple Store, and I don't know, it's five bucks or something. It's 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 cheap, but it gives you full control, and it's sort of fun to play with, um, just because it gives you manual control over the iPhone. Uh, Zoom. Okay, so, so it's not a it's not a solar specific. Correct. Um, it's not. okay. I I use um, Pro Camera, but I thought somehow that I couldn't do that for this because Pro Camera I can shoot raw in, shoot raw you, files. So. Yeah, the Pro the Pro Shot will do raw too. Actually, yeah. I guess they're I guess they're Heif, uh, H E I F, but it converts to raw to some format of raw. Yeah, I think and, um, Pro Camera shoots direct into raw, doesn't shoot into the height. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I I somehow had it in my head that it had to be a solar eclipse app to go with this. I never well, thought to even try my regular iPhone camera shooting app. Yeah, and I and I found you know, the the logical. Uh, path I followed was I looked up who made that pro shot mm -hmm. and found they make this other thing and it looks like pro shot is actually a um a, a dummy down version a simplified version that just does the solar range of, uh, mm -hmm. of exposures uh, but I think the other one does it better and like I said I I had a hard time getting the correct exposure with uh the solar snap the other problem yeah. i had the other problem i had with the design of the um of the filter holder the little velcro i'm um i'm wary of anything that doesn't hold the filter uh <coughs> totally flat on the lens and allows any light to get in from behind because during the partial phases you'll be getting one hundred thousandth of the direct sunlight coming through the front, but you get no attenuation of the light coming in around the sides. So unless you hold that filter all the way in, you're going to get some not ghosting, but you're going to get some scattered light from the back side of the filter. And um, so for that reason, I'm not all that interested in the in the um, Velcro attachment technique they used. I think they should have had something. They should have made a, a Velcro donut sort of to hold it around the lenses and hold it in tightly. And that, that would be an easy enough thing or just take some gaffer tape and tape it to your phone for the day. Yeah, that's what I figure I'm doing because I'm, I'm not going to use the iPhone for uh, totality. I right. I doubt uh, you can't change the F ratio. It's going to be always what F to eight, and um, you can only change exposure time and uh, and effective ISO uh, for uh, for the sensitivity. Okay, I think um, there are a couple more slides. It's getting close to nine o'clock. Um, don't have to do too much. There were some. I had some topics for discussion. Does anybody have anything? We've had a good wide ranging discussion. Anybody have anything else they want to bring up to the group with uh, questions or actions or other things they've discovered over the past month? I have uh, something quick. I just wanted to mention uh, a couple of times we've talked about Kate Rousseau and her series of books on total eclipse observing. She's now scheduled to be our uh, Novak speaker on January the 14th. So looking forward to that. She's a, oh, okay. she's a psychologist that's done several books on the psychology of observing total eclipses. And uh, our latest, her last book, Being in the Shadow, uh, we're going to be able to get some buy and purchase of that if somebody wants a copy of that. So it's normally like 17 bucks on Amazon. We'll, we'll get them for 15 or something like that. But anyway, I just want to mention that. So the January 14th Novak meeting will be Dr. Kate Rousseau. Very good. Glad you glad you invited. I assume you were the one who invited her. 
spring. Yeah, I've known okay. her for six or seven years, and so I, I and I she was in Uvalde, uh, Texas, and uh, she will be again for the total eclipse. So we had a good chance after knowing each other uh, remotely for years. Finally got to meet her in person. Cool, cool lady. She's done some incredible science. So the impact of brain, the the, the what happens chemistry in the brain when uh, we experience all. I mean, it's it's pretty interesting stuff. Cool. One one quick thing. I think it's Fred Espinac's site for the people who are looking for exposures. I think it's on that site that there's a good list of exposures at least to shoot for so that you have some kind of guidance as to the exposures during the different phases. I think he has a chart. Yeah, I've I've got several references on the on the resources page on the website to that and to um Oh, I'm blanking on whose book. Um, Alan Dyer. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's right. He has a comprehensive um, list of bracketing exposures for to, for all the phases. Um, and he goes into yeah. a lot of detail on the background, but he's also got some simple tables. Um, the good news is there's sort of no there's no wrong exposure for eclipses because there's so so much dynamic range. But um, there is really a range of something like 15 stops of, uh, of exposure. If you really want to go from, from the chromosphere and the, and the prominences at the inside to the outer, outer corona, it's a, it's a very wide range. Uh, and separately, uh, if you want to get good at it, there's a call for high dynamic range post-processing to combine all those stacked images. And I've never done that successfully. I'm still, I still have my raw files from 2017, which I'm one of these days I'm going to get around to trying to do HDR processing on. It's on my to-do list. Uh, I do think that um, Me too. I mentioned that next talk on uh on the, Kalam uh, on the Kalamazoo uh, Astronomical Society. Um, part, he's, he's talking part two about eclipse image processing. Part one was photography and part two was processing. So that'd probably be very useful on the 15th. Okay. Um, two, two quick things, uh, Alan. Sure. First, first of all, I wanted to- what uh, you said about using a Hoodman. Uh, I've got one here, and you can, I don't know if you can see it, but it has a focus ring, so you can focus on the uh, uh, nomenclature and stuff that's on your display on the back. On the and, screen, uh, yeah. uh, on, the, on the screen, on the LCD, and then you can use it to get a fine focus uh, on your uh, actual image. And I, I've got these things, which are just kind of like bungee cords, and I can't remember whether it came with them or I bought them separately. But then each of these hooks around the camera and holds it firm and keeps the light out. Uh, and I used it again on the 20, uh, on this last annular eclipse, and it worked, worked just great. The second thing is on this Greg, last Greg, eclipse, was that, yeah. was that it? Is that a generic that you have the brand? On oh, that? it's a Hoodman. Hoodman. Hoodman, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's this is what the the little case looks like. If that's you can see that. No, probably not. Anyway, uh, I've had that since 2017 and it's worked great for both. The second thing I wanted to mention is um, I think I've mentioned before that I set up with a telescope. And that goes in auto after you get the alignment uh, set uh, with bracketed exposures. And I take a D500 with an 80 to 400 Nikon lens, and I just shoot in autofocus uh, uh, with bracketed exposures uh, while I'm sitting there because it has a, a different filter. It's got the Thousand Oaks more pleasing uh, color. And while my telescope is going, not at totality, obviously, uh, but while my telescope is going, I'm shooting handheld just to keep myself occupied. 
And both sets have turned out very well. And in fact, I did it through totality uh, in between uh, increased um, uh, time lapse or, or shortened time lapse, I should say, on, on the uh, 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 telescope camera. So uh, I don't know whether you realize it, but the autofocus does pick up and does work, or at least on the Nikon it did, uh, on, on the Eclipse, even with the filter on. So that, that's all I wanted to mention. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's something people have to try. People should probably try with their own equipment because the techniques of autofocus differ from manufacturer to manufacturer. Oh, right. And, um, and there's so, and, so many uh, options these days. I, I don't right. know what to recommend. Right. Uh, and the other thing is I've seen warnings, although I don't know the magnitude of the problem, that especially with long lenses, long camera lenses, the focus may change during the eclipse, especially during re if, if you're at, at a place where it cools down rapidly just before totality. Some of the long lenses don't even have a fixed stop at infinity because there may be a variation in optimal focus. And uh, I, I've got a Nikon lens from my setup and I noticed that factor that you can't just go to the, inf there is no stop at infinity. It goes a little bit beyond so you can adjust. But uh, that's because they, they believe they have a temperature dependence. Not on all lenses, but some of the long yeah. ones. Uh, do, using autofocus, of course, bypasses would that. Get you, would get you around that, right. Yeah. Thanks, Craig. Okay. Um, I've got a list which mostly came up from last month, but I'm going to skip over that. I will mention Novak still has Eclipse glasses for distribution. Um, if you come to this meeting or the next meeting or uh, maybe if you go to Sky Meadows at their uh, event, the next time it's clear, um, there are some solar eclipse glasses available, both for your own use and to distribute broadly to friends, family, neighbors, schools, your kids, grandkids go to whatever um, that we're, we're distributing based on the bulk purchase. And uh, I'm not going to talk about these other topics because it's, it's already nine o'clock. Um, I'm suggesting that we not do a session in January just because everybody is so cold and miserable and recovering from um, from the holidays. Uh, possibly that's a good time to uh, go to your living room and practice, pretend that the sun is up there and that it's April and hot and sunny in Texas or wherever you're going and just go through the motions and, uh, and learn your camera. Maybe that's something to do as homework in January. And then we'll get together again in February and March. Um, I don't have any specific suggestions uh, from people about what to do. Although I think we should probably be going over um, some of the people's descriptions of their plans for April, just to give people a feel for um what other people think they're going to be doing, have planned to do, have made firm reservations. We may have other questions from the club more generally by then. Bill Burton suggested that we try to engage the rest of the membership and make them aware of the issues as, as, uh, as it gets close and they get desperate about deciding what to do about April 8th. Uh, we can talk about that more broadly at the, uh, at the February meeting. And then I had my list here of, uh, of other topics, but those will largely be coming OBE. One which had come up, and the reason I asked a question earlier on, was um, portable, uh, reliable uh, power systems. If your mount system, if your rig needs more than just the batteries that come inside, if you need something more robust. And in the past, we've talked about the fact, even if you think you're going to plug into the wall someplace where you're observing or bring along extension cords, you might want a battery and an inverter just in case somebody decides that uh, 
your extension cord is more important for them than for you. Uh, or as people have talked about, you think you've made arrangements to uh, to observe in a parking lot and then someone turns off the lights in the parking lot and they also turn off the power in the, to the uh, to the 110 outlets. So um, people have advised that you should be uh, autonomous on uh, on your power system. And we might talk about that, what people have picked up. I plan to have a, a homebrew system of uh, of a large lithium battery and uh, an inverter, which I've uh, used in the past and has worked well for me. So that's for next sessions. Um, don't don't forget the airline restrictions as well. Make sure that you look those up and uh, comply as required. Yeah, I'm I'm going to be driving, so I don't have all the weight and um, and and legal restrictions. And in in some cases, it may be that you uh, UPS it to yourself beforehand at the place you're staying, and um, hopefully the uh, the connections will be only a few days, and that that also applies to to telescopes, although you might not want to risk your telescopes to UPS, but batteries they can probably not damage too much. So that's it for uh, for what I had for this session. Unless uh, anybody has anything else I'd like to contribute or or suggest, um, I, I wish everybody. Happy holidays and uh, see you in February, if not before. So anything else? Guess not. Thanks especially to the uh, to the people who presented uh, for putting together your slides for us. I know it's uh, it's a bit of a pain. I hope you get to reuse them with with other groups and uh, and motivate them about what's coming up. And uh, see you in February. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Great yeah. session. All right. Great session. Thank you. Good holiday.